Uh, welcome back to this uh, uh, last session. But this is an enduring session because there is an association with Sharmila. All the people on the panel were deeply associated with, thickly associated with the intellectual journey of Sharmila and her own persona as the social being, human being. Uh, so, uh, I am particularly thankful to the organizers for really uh, uh, keeping this panel this evening to uh, carry forward the intellectual and ethical legacy of Sharmila. And as we all know, she left us uh, uh, quite early and so we are all in a kind of a shock. Uh, but anyway, we have to carry forward our agenda and, 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 and see that, you know, whatever uh, uh, roadmap Sharmila, uh, our investment Sharmila made in terms of really building uh, the kind of in intellectual uh, capital uh, that we have to really take that uh, legacy, inherit that legacy and take that legacy forward. I don't need to uh, uh, repeat the point that panelists today are uh, uh, morally competent, morally, morally qualified, intellectually competent and politically committed uh, to take this uh, legacy forward. I have something to say about uh, uh, Shamila, uh, the Shamila's whole uh, uh, universe of ideas and her own uh, scheme of uh, uh, putting those ideas into practice, the pedagogy part. I mean, so, such an innovative uh, pedagogy she developed to really make things easy, make theory actually easy. And test theories, there are all kinds of theories uh, at the level of practice. Defeat them, reject them, appropriate them, reconfigure them, and go ahead. So that was a very, very unique pedagogical tool this she used. And uh, myself was actually uh, the witness to this whole thing that she was doing. Almost three to four people in the small death center of Tarabai, uh, sorry, Tarabai uh, Fule, uh, Section K, Section in Pune University. Uh, so, uh, so I would, uh, without lo losing much time, there's also some kind of a stupid compulsion on me and other friends to really uh, 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 catch the flight at about 8:15. So we are scared about uh, traffic because we took about one hour, one hour and 40 minutes for some odd reasons. Cinema doesn't believe in this, but it is the traffic or matter. But though, though no disrespect of traffic. But it is uh, it is a problem. So I'm, I was actually asking Susie. Susie, as a tall person, always having uh, her, uh, you know chatra on us, not chatra, but the chatra on us. Uh, but she refused to, and so I would uh, somehow, if if you uh, if you permit me, I'll, I'll just go ahead and uh, this there is the order, and I'll uh, uh, go by that order as suggested by the organizers. I don't want to ready. Uh, there are uh, four very, very important panelists on this particular theme. Uh, remembering Sharmila, uh, uh, caste, gender, and pedagogy, there was some reference to what uh, Umesh was speaking in the earlier session, and we have been speaking right of what, uh, uh, first, first, first session onwards. So, uh, so they are very, uh, very, very uh, intensely engaged with work Sharmila did. So, uh, Dr. Yeshudasan uh, will start. Is that okay? He will start. You will start, start now, then no, you can't change now. Uh, uh, then Susie will uh, take over and then, uh, uh, then Sanjay and finally Swati. Is that okay? It is okay anyway. Uh, Dr. Yesudasan, can I introduce you for a few seconds? And so, Dr. Yesudasan is a leading figure in the Dalit literary movement, a key mentor of the Dalit students movement has, in Kerala, I guess, has been an important figure in Kerala's public life. He retired as the head of the department of CMC College, Kottayam in 2008. He was also a visiting professor of the Department of Culture Studies, EPLU, Hyderabad. He has been editor of two historically significant little magazines, uh, You Are Locum and Dynamic Action. He also, ha he also has edited a special number on black poetry, very interesting. He has been at the forefront of the Dalit Christian struggle within the Church of South India uh, in the 70s and the 80s. 
नून एस दी जनक की या विश्वा विश्वासा विमोचना प्रतिष्ठाना प्रतिष्ठाना या दैट ड्यू इट्स सस्टेनेंस फ्रॉम ब्लैक थियोलॉजी इसुदासन इज एट प्रेजेंट जनरल एडिटर ऑफ मलयालम रिसर्च जर्नल आई थिंक आई वाज बेनिफिशियरी ऑफ दैट लेट यू नो समटाइम बैक सो आई आई थिंक आई कैन आल्सो सेपर पब्लिश्ड फ्रॉम दिस इज द जर्नल व्हिच इज पब्लिश्ड फ्रॉम कोट्टयम इट्स इन इट्स इन इंग्लिश बाइलिंगुअल हिज रिसेंट बुक इज अबाउट व्हाई डोंट यू रिपीट दिस बाल बाल ये दुख कालु दे वामश वेरी वेरी एक्साइटिंग presentation and uh, we have 20 minutes at disposal i'm going to give 2 minutes more to suzy yeah <coughs> the the moderator dr gopal kuru suzy swati my dear friends my association with Rage is reading her book, uh, especially writing caste writing there. I am also interested in the in the question of the relation between caste and gender, and I think my first published article was on caste and gender. That was back in 1955. that we brought to you said in Delhi but uh, today i'm not going to speak anything about reggae i leave that to suzy and others i had accidentally dictated a topic to satya because satya was so coercive and <laughs> insisting uh, so i have to uh, just make a short presentation on the on the topic it is the dread of identity the uncanny caste and kind of i was uh, wondering how to begin the presentation then susi is sitting on the side susi one day told me You are only ten percent in Dalit. Ten percent of Dalit. She she keeps telling us as well. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, the I go farther to admit that I am only one percent in Dalit. But that one percent is so stinking, so humiliating, so disgraceful that I am not proud to be a Dalit. So this is. the dread of identity this is not simply my dread of my own identity <coughs> this is also bilateral or trilateral dread it is also a dread of the society of my identity because the society is afraid of my identity in kerala which is dominated by cpm politics in order to avoid that chain dalit they have recently formed an organization a party organization scheduled caste welfare association <coughs> in the case of uh, the tribals they didn't go by the state category instead of scheduled tribe welfare of association they used the adivasi shema samiti adivasi welfare association this is just to explain the the, the first part the initial part of my topic the title of the talk i would like to draw 
appears uh, structure of identity, his description of the structure of identity from the ethics of identity. It has got three elements. One is the, the availability of a label, the presence of a label in society, which is understood by all in society. That there are a group of people called Dalits or Adivasis or women, that kind of label. And the second is the identification, the process of identification. Those people who have been labeled as Dalits, they come together emotionally, politically, culturally, identifying <coughs> with each other. This is the second element of the structure of identity. And the third one is the treatment as Dalits, which I don't like, which I at the beginning, I said, I hate. I'm not proud to be a Dalit. <coughs> there are some people who I have heard some people say that I'm proud to be a Sri Lankan or I'm proud to be a <coughs> Dalit. I'm not, not proud to be a Dalit. It is so uh, degrading an identity. There are several types of identities. Some identities ennoble you, it enables you enables you, it empowers you, it entails you with privileges and power. But identities like Dalit, it deprives you of privileges, <coughs> dignity, honor, power. Uh, we have been uh, this conference, it has been reflecting on theory, philosophy, politics, understanding, emancipation. I come from the literary discipline where most of my colleagues, they would say, what has theory to do with literature, reading literature? Even before theory, people have been reading literature. So this is tangential, this whole business of uh, philosophy theory. But I disagree with them, and I do uh, believe in <coughs> the efficacy, the usefulness of theory, philosophy, in understanding the question of emancipation. I draw on because in relation to the notion of identity, I drawn Lacan's as a article, the mirror stage. Because mirroring, the notion of the idea of mirroring, it contributes largely to the shaping of oneself, one's uh, ego, oneself. So the importance of mirroring what is called the mirroring, the process of mirroring. And uh, Gobal Guru and uh, uh, Sal Kai, they, they have cracked the mirror. <laughs> so for these kind of identities, the mirror available is often a cracked mirror, the broken pieces, the splinters of uh, <coughs> Despite the, the splinters or the broken character memory, uh, still this mirroring is operating. And uh, <coughs> we come to the question of uh, uh, who are we modeling, whose images are we borrowing to mimic or shape our self, our identity. This is a, an important question. The, the just the, the preceding session was raising the question of caste, caste uh, patriarchy. Well, I also have a similar question 
what is the cost of Oedipus complex? The cost of Oedipus complex. Maybe Gandhi understood this earlier. That's why he called it these people Harijans, a people without father icon, father figures, without an Oedipus to represent the power, the false, the authority, the powerless people. Now, so Gandhi, he went on idealizing these primitives like the Europeans did, the primitives, the European anthropologists, they idealized the noble savage. And they also did the same, idealized the indigenous uh, people as uh, the noble bastards. Uh, uh, Lacan, he drew largely from philosophy, from phenomenology, from Husserl, from Heidegger, from uh, the ethology, the study of animal behavior, uh, especially from the, the ethologist Roger Kailoy, his idea of mimicry. See, the animals, in order to protect themselves from hostile surroundings, they adapt to the surrounding. They just uh, imitate the surrounding. They change color to just cite an example. So this kind of mimicry uh, is there. And in the case of uh, oppressed identities, it is the the process called assimilation. You have to assimilate. When our forefathers, they, they embraced Christianity, they were assimilating, adapting to, they were changing color to protect themselves, to preserve themselves from I, the, the oppression of caste, the oppression of slavery. Sarai, please pray for me. I will. Because <laughs> <laughs> he is now uh, deep in bed. Yeah, deeply into the project of prayer. Prayer as force, prayer as power, prayer as protest, resistance. So, assimilate, you assimilate to a respectable <coughs> image a fascinating image, an attractive image. What are the attractive images among the Dalits? Gandhi said, no image, not even a single icon in Dalit community. So you have to imitate, mimic on the idea of the upper caste, the Brahmin, the Vishnu, etc. So we, our identity, the identities, often called upon to or forced it to shape itself, <coughs> mimicking alien, strange items, images. The the harder image, because there are people who are doing visual studies, there are people who to film studies. Madhav is there, uh, Bhattasarvi is there. There are a lot of people who are uh, dealing with that. Uh, Sadish is there. All are uh, studying images, the, the nature, the effect of images on your vision. Our eyes have a history. Our eyes are historically constituted. The way we look at things, the way we understand things are all historically uh, uh, situated or constructed. So we have to be uh, conscious of this important uh, fact when we discuss emancipation in terms of philosophy, 
theory and politics. There is a politics of Laura Mulvey in her heartbreaking article. She uh, speaks about the various uh, gazes, including the male case, the gaze of the camera, the gaze of the protagonist in the narrative, the gaze of the male characters in the narrative, all kinds of gazes. So these are all important when we discuss or try to understand the heterogeneity in the world of identities. Uh, now, I was under the impression that I am a decent Christian. Uh, I <coughs> imitated or I shaped my <coughs> identity uh, looking at the Syrian Christians, the decent Christians, the church-going Christians, the Christians who uh, sing and uh, read the Bible. Uh, but this confidence, it was shattered on various occasions. I continue to be posited myself as a decent Christian by repressing a lot of things, a lot of very instinctive, natural uh, attributes of myself. I uh, gave up, abandoned certain behaviors. I uh, developed new habits, new ways of speech, behavior, etc. But in spite of all this, the, the repressed often return to me. It, that is uncanny, the return of the repressed. A neighbor of mine, a neurotic woman, uh, he was, she, she is not neurotic, she is not known to the neighborhood as a neurotic person. She, when she is normal, she would never uh, notice us. She would never, she does not have anything to do with us. She wouldn't speak to us. But when she is sick, she will just storm into our house. One day she came like that. I was sitting on the sofa. She came and sat by my side on the sofa. She touched me and she wanted me to give her something to drink. Uh, this is like the dream work where the images are sometimes inverted. She was suggesting to me that despite your beautiful house, despite your car, despite the modern amenities you have, you are an untouchable. I cannot touch you when I am normal. So this, these are things which we call the unconscious. The unconscious is not a personal, a subjective thing. It is a, an inner subjective thing, something that lies in the symbolic world, connecting all of us. So that is why I, I began with the statement that this dread is not my own dread. This is a dread that we all share. <coughs> so all, uh, all kinds of uh, beautiful uh, categories, uh, concepts have been uh, used, deployed <coughs> to repress mind reality, my truth, my real identity. The people, Dalits in Kerala, most of them are in the, due to historical reasons, it is not because of their choice, they, it was imposed on them through slavery. The, the communists, they call them agricultural laborers, the class subjects. 
and they just uh, pushed the fact of caste on the ground. But this caste, it has been the the the, the repress, it has been overwhelmed, on returning, coming back in the form of disruptions, eruptions in several places of Kerala. The the only meaningful struggles happening in Kerala are Dalit struggles for land, for dignity, for better uh, deal. Then the CPM, the communists, they were the forces who came to oppose them. <coughs> they were in power and they used all means of police force. They let loose the cruelties of police force on the return of the repressed. And the party was forced to organize a scheduled caste welfare association to counter the yeah. emergence of uh, the system. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. You have five minutes. Yes, I'm coming back to philosophy, to Heidegger. Heidegger, he posited something like a project, the notion of project. And I, I'm just, I'm a bricolor. I'm not an engineer. I just use borrowed notions and ideas without understanding them. The, the whole implications. He uses the project, the term project. The project is, see, when we have a consciousness, the consciousness is historically constituted, situated. We become aware of our position, our situation, and then we project to the future. We want to change this situation, and this change can be realized only by making a move to the future. I hope this this conference is a positive move towards the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Sudarshan, one doesn't require more time to say important things. Yeah, Suzy said, no, five minutes, you should check more. And I was with the uh, important filter here. Uh, but I must tell you, we will have a discussion on this before we take on yes. to this video, because it's a different separate thing. That's my suggestion. What do you think? We'll have a separate Yes. Uh, where is the uh, Huh? Okay. <laughs> Permission granted. <laughs> this is Telangana now. We have a different <laughs> I mean, three points is making, and there is a connection to this running thread. Uh, uh, and I'm happy that you are making necessary connect, necessary connection between literature and larger philosophical groundings of this literature. So that's one important, very very encouraging and healthy sign of this seminar, uh, on, in the, uh, conference. One of those points. One is on Anthony Apaya's ethics of identity. That stuck three structures of identity. One was uh, uh, from there you started, and you made two important points, and there are several points actually, uh, but two important points are about your take on cracked mirror. <laughs> uh, which is something which is so enlivening to our, our, our own our imagination. We are talking about cracked mirror, and we don't have any full uh, complete mirror, and the, our images are, no, it's a inversion. Actually, our mirror is complete, full frame, intact, but it appears to be cracked. That's why the return of the repressed is to be seen in terms of the return of uh, this crack mirror, which is re-signified with the return of the repressed. Uh, that's one important point. The other point is that came in Shah Rukh's, uh, presentation, the banality of the ordinary. And the, or, the evil is always ordinary. And in Eichmann, Hannah Arendt's Eichmann, the fellow is not rational, fellow is simply mechanically mechanically executing the orders of Nazi, uh, Hitler, Eichmann. And somebody asked him, why are you really uh, uh, people executing the Jews? 
you have friends, you have family, you are sons, and still you are doing that. You don't have concern. No. I am not at all concerned about it. My duty is to execute them. Her duty is to say that you are untouchable. Though she is the beneficiary of your patronage. And that in Shahrukh also it has come. So this is the biggest evil that we are facing. How to get rid, how to really get rid of this banality which is ordinarily available at every level of your sensibility and your existence. And it is patriarchy, it is car, everywhere you find this banality of evil operating and actually trying to uh, become a trait and uh, def um, uh, making it impossible to really go for the change. So that is another very, very important uh, thing. The other one is about the process of containment, uh, 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 about the identity, uh, uh, the identity question that you're raising is uh, your, your identification becomes an illusion. <coughs> You know, whether it is, and, and Sanar is making Christianity, uh, Buddhism is still the possibility, they say. Uh, but your identification is, is an illusion. And that is not something you are actually wishing. But your experience shows that, no, it is not perhaps the right option. Just as it is not the right option to become a Dalit, Dalit Brahmin. So, oh, it is one. So, the, the, the process of con processes of containment. Why is this banality so hostile, the evil is so hostile, that really it really, it contains you from within, doesn't really allow you to explore in your own uh, different, you know, generic identities. Not one, but there are many identities. So, these are issues, uh, uh, I thought. Uh, and last quick point was, uh, why is that one identity becomes a burden? There is identity and then this is so this point. One person is a problem. But I think we'll have to take a view on the role of categories. Uh, the emergence, revolutionary role and the disappearance. There are three moments in the life of categories. Emergence, role and disappearance. Now, how, you cannot, I mean, this one moral declaration that Dalit identity is a problem. Because it really, it really stigmatizes me. Uh, but then the problem is, and Heidegger, you are actually <coughs> making sense of history. Only through your thrownness, you are, you are, you are actually caught in it. You made the last point. You are we not denying that investment people made historically into producing it? And that's one sound problem from my side. We can have more discussion on this. We will have about 10 minutes and then we can switch over to other. other. Yes, please. Is there somebody who can, uh, who feels urgent about it? I felt urgent, therefore I made four points. <coughs> I have a... Uh, yes, please, yes. Uh, the, the positive construction of Dalit identity has to be addressed to me. In 1938, it was uh, in Bombay presidency. That was... Uh, you can come to this, sir. The amendment bill was uh, uh, came and there uh, in local self government uh, the <coughs> reservation was given to Dalits and that is SCSTs. So at was the word SCST was annulled and it was Harijan word was uh, amended. The amendment was of uh, putting Harijan word as the uh, I, I can say in place of SCST. So there was debate in Bobby presidency where uh, uh, Ambedkar and uh, Gaikwad took a part. Where you will you have to have find that this SCST, the translation in uh, uh, Janta is Dalit. So there is a positive construction of Dalit identity. I will cite two examples as Dalit as vanguards of class <coughs> rebellion. One, there was a rebellion which took place in uh, Kokan where uh, the Kunubi peasant, <coughs> then the Agri peasant and Mahar peasant both united against the Khoti system and courts were, uh, majority of courts were Brahmins. And uh, the, 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 the struggle was led by the Mahas as vanguards. And the identity was Dalit. I will, I will cite another example of Dalit as a positive construction. Uh, is uh, At the same time, it was state dispute bill. And at that time, it was a large kind of, you can say, uh, protest organized in Mumbai. And the vanguard was uh, Dalit. 
So Dalit as a positive construction, as as by those Dalits, and Dalit as a negative construction by Brahmins. So what we will choose? Yeah. So we should we should choose the way we are constructing our identities, and we should not give up the kind of we can say identities where within which we are struggling. This is very important identity which has given us a subject a democratic subject, which which this Dalit identity which has given us a certain kind of we can say a subject which is which is which is going for emancipation, <coughs> fighting caste, fighting gender, fighting caste patriarchy. So this is the positive aspects of uh, the, the word Dalit. So why we should somehow somehow so 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 offensive about the yeah. identity called Dalit? It is so constructive and so positive. Okay. okay but Can I have it? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I have seen them first and then you. Uh, uh, Madhav, uh, Ravi, and uh, Rafish, Raji, Rajesh. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, um, just uh, yeah, thank you. Is this a very uh, thoughtful uh, paper? I'm, I'm wondering, actually, in relation to uh, the earlier Professor uh, uh, Bagre's paper also, there was a question which I think Sunita put, and I think that had to do with the context, right? Why should uh, something like Brahminical patriarchy matter? You know, that kind of a question. It's a serious question. And uh, when you said project, uh, it, I, I felt there was a little commonality there, which is the question about thinking the whole of which, <coughs> that is, not only thinking of the image, to say the project of the Dalit, but the, the whole, the, the entire thing, thinking the image of the other also, I mean, that is in not emancipating the other as a, as a project, in, in, if you like. It is there. Yeah, you know, it should be, I mean, in the sense that <coughs> there is no, it's difficult to conceive that it's, it can be uh, isolated from the rest. So in that sense, that, uh, how, how we would like to uh, okay. think about that. You come here. Okay. You are displacing so many people. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is uh, when you said that I'm not proud, I'm not proud uh, to be called as Dalit. I'll just give you two examples actually before uh, entering into that debate. When we recently went to cover the Chaiti Bhumi, some people asked me what, what camera I have. I said it's a Dalit camera. <coughs> We had a big fight. They said it is, should be Buddhism, not Dalit. Yeah. And uh, why the word Dalit still you are using? And from South Indian perspective, I had my own argument, but still I couldn't survive. But there were other uh, Dalits who could, Buddhists who could, they did. <laughs> then even in the campus recently, one Ambedkar uh, met me in the campus, and he said, what are you working? They were introducing actors. I said, Dalit camera. Again, he went with a stick to beat me up. He mm -hmm. said that, what is Dalit? How long you'll be pondering with the word Dalit? But I want to narrate this one. So there is a notion that the, the word yes. Dalit problem. But there is another understanding from a, a scavenging community's perspective. Because the entire Dalit movement, at once one point of a history, if I'm not wrong, that rejected the occupations. But at one another point, later point of the history, the same occupation was taken as an emancipation. For example, the parayas would be taking the tapu and saying that we will not beat for others, but that is my equipment, what the hell it is. So, but this kind of a thing is also there. But coming to the scavenging caste, even those communities which asserted with their own Mahar identity, or uh, Chamar identity, or even Madhya, MRPS identities, but they uh, no Dalit community which can speak. I have not <coughs> seen, even the scavenging community is not ready to take even their broom as a weapon. You see, every occupation, took that as a weapon. So that I mean to say that this, uh, the Dalit identity itself, though we talk about one angle, which you generalizely say, in a larger perspective that Dalit word is an untouchable. And I don't want to use that. But I'm saying that it is not always, even in that, you choose to, uh, already that is a notion that scavenging community cannot use this. So that is the point. So that I, I think I'm seriously pondering in between these two things. OK. Yes, please. Uh, I have a fear about the numbers which are mentioned by Dr. Ishwas and then Dr. reiterated that 1%, 10%, 10%. Is there somewhere a desire felt and sustained or reproduced towards an authentic identity as Dalit? And what is the genealogy of that? Do we need to search for it? 
and in that way when we talk about identity burden burden of identity we all sometimes play with our identities in different context somewhere we fake uh, no do not reveal so in that context what is this desire towards some person <coughs> or an authentic authenticity or authentic idea of an identity Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, I think I will have to conclude this one. Uh, okay. okay. Do you want me to answer? I think I will. Uh, no, no, no. Please let him answer. <laughs> But yeah, one is to me, so I will answer. Okay. <laughs> mm. See, uh, the the best way to advance knowledge is. to polemic when you are polemic or polemic you, you don't uh, uh, argue both sides right okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> very well i think what is uh, identity is on trial actually so there is no authenticity involved in this so that's that's what is uh, not that i wanted to put on trial but it is there on trial and then uh, the ethics of authenticity is something much deeper and uh, much more difficult thing to really uh, hold on to because if authenticity is actually related to ontology again and that means you are authentic being that means you have some kind of ontological relationship between conviction and its description <coughs> you are you are your uh, sorry your perception and your description these are not anti antithetical things what you pursue is honestly described and there is no asymmetry between the two and that is the big challenge and therefore uh yesterday somebody said uh, in some yesterday or something uh the the, the objection that was taken uh by uh, in the pra prajavani i think ravi prajavani thing we look at this thing the prajavani who said that we don't follow caste i have not faced caste is dalit whereas others were saying that we are actually practicing caste all the upper caste and that's the that is inauthentic identity you you are not really demonstrating what you really want to pursue and there is kind of a very very a tragic containment so therefore your your identity on trial can be either a tragic or a comic and most of the time and cinema studies the oh. little entries are comic on the television they are projected as such and therefore should we really pursue <coughs> and dalit dalit has a different universe so i think but this is he is not speaking out of but he is as a fresh this harijan my the edipus edipus is that something new to me actually and always has some something to do on something to do on harijan and then feminism it has implication for feminism actually and you can actually critique <coughs> gandhi uh, taking this uh, oh so thank you very much dr yashoda arsan for your uh, very very insightful uh, uh, intervention at this point of time now can i switch on to the other three panelists with same uh, you know thing so uh, i would now request uh, so the one person is not of issue oh it came late Uh, so, uh, Professor Suzy Tarun, I do I really require to really, uh, no. introduce her? So why do you just speak? No, sorry. No, no. no, no. I will. I will. I will. I will speak something. <laughs> Suzy Tarun is. The no, See. <laughs> <laughs> do you want her me to introduce her? No. Yeah, no. 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 Okay. No. Okay. One percent. Yeah. Thank you. Very generous of her. Let me just say that. whatever it is that may quote me again in an embarrassing situation but he has always been my teacher and as yes and as you <laughs> you must have all felt today that there was something that reaches out and grabs you and touches you in the way he thinks and the and i want to thank you thank you just for being that somewhere in a very very minor way what i have to say today also connects with what he has been saying but in a very minor way you know i'm not just attaching myself to it. uh i'm going to speak a little more about sharmila and about 
uh, one part of her work which I really admire and almost envy, since we are in psychoanalytical terms now, almost envy, because of what she has been able to achieve there, and that is her work with pedagogy. And I want to introduce that to you. I'm not sure how many of you probably know about this, but I'm not sure how many do. Uh, so Gopal, you who know so much about it must no. excuse me about this. No. Let me just say that one of the literature, there is another perspective, there is other information, there are other questions, there is another sense of what is literature that must come to teaching the lit literature. So adding the lit literature to the syllabus is not really doing much. I mean, it just is, is recuperating. In it. So there's a whole work of upgrading, transformation, uh, and, and so on that needs to, to come into play, which has to put aside the old idea of education, which was of uplifting, upgrading, passing information on, teaching in some way, that idea is, is non-functional because we are not left with people who know how to teach or know what to teach. The, the, we, we're all results of this dysfunctional education and we are at this point where we are confronted with something that is showing our <coughs> education up as dysfunctional. What does this mean? Does it mean we all, again, just give everything up and uh, sit back or are they the, and this is where these new experiments that have come up, which are not pedagogy in the old sense, but pedagogy in a very, very new sense that are uh, worth, I think, documenting and thinking about and investigating, uh, not just extending the old to the new classroom, but making a new knowledge and in that process, reworking the university. Uh, and one experiment that I want to share with you is uh, the ex an experiment. I have not been part of the Pune University work at all. I have uh, heard about it from other people. But there's this book that has been brought out uh, by the Women's Studies Department in, in Pune University. And it's a book that's called, Isn't This Plate Indian? Dalit Histories of Memories and Food. And this is a book <coughs> written by the Women's Studies uh, class uh, WS10, which is the course number, class of 2009. It's a book produced by this class. Now, what did this class do? And uh, their instructor was Sharmila Rege, and there are two other people whose names I've, uh, I, I wasn't familiar with, so I've, I've just uh, not remembered. It started by. Dinara. Dipatak and Dinara. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Kamble is also part of, of this yes, group. Yes, yes, yeah. Huh? yeah. Anil, no, no, what is and Sangeeta Tosha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so a couple of them are students, and I think another one is a, is a teacher. So what do they start? They start by reading the classics, the classics on, uh, what is the course called? It's called Caste and Gender in Modern India, History and Memory. And they start by reading the classics. Now, uh, the interesting question is, what are the classics? And let me just read out to you from their introduction. This is a group introduction. We began with reading Jyoti Bapule's Satsar, and uh, uh, before turning to the feminist explorations of Dr. Ambedkar's castes in India, <coughs> the rise and fall of Hindu, Hindu women, riddles in Hinduism, and Ramaswami Naikar Pereya's critique of enforced motherhood. So these are the classics. A new bibliography has been set up for this question of, of caste and gender. And then they next go into looking at memory work. How has memory work critiqued, used, or how was it used by the feminist movement to critique history? How is memory work used to bring new knowledges into uh, the, the field of, of, of uh, the scholarship and the academy? How is this new knowledge uh, uh, available now for reuse? Okay, so then they do another set of readings, which is a readings about memory work. And among the readings about memory work are three or four autobiographies that are available both in Marathi and in, uh, in English. So, 
Uh, what I didn't tell you is that this class is comprised of students from Marathi medium as well as students from English medium and they were looking for materials that are available both in Marathi and in English and they are speaking to each other, they are reading the same text in different languages and they are speaking to each other about these texts. So they read these autobiographies and the autobiographies are an introduction to what uh, the, the course calls memory work, which now is a term used in historiography, and it's a way of thought out also as a way, not only of looking, treating a literary text like autobiography, but also thinking about history. Uh, and the four life narratives that they chose are Vasant Moon, Baby Kamble, uh, uh, Sharad Kumar Limbale, and uh, 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 Valmiki's uh, Ju Jutan. And we all see these are texts we all know about, but then they're suddenly positioned in this place. They get a new, new for us as well, we, we see them in a new light, and we also see the possibilities that come when you can use a both the original and the translation in class. They also then study their Uma Chakravarti, uh, who was referred to earlier today, is passing through at that point. So she comes in and takes a class, and she explains to them how she arrived at this notion of Brahminic <coughs> patriarchy and there is some discussion of it and a critique of it as well and there are also discussions in this class not only of uh, uh, women but also of masculinity uh, it, so it's uh, extending the gender question in, in a, uh, a, a way but then what do they go on to do so these, this is the study with which they start what do they go on to do uh, they choose as their project food uh, and uh, Dalit, Dalit narratives around food. And how do they work with this? They choose 10 people they will go and interview, 10 women. And uh, they ask about these women's lives and they also ask about their experiences of food. Now, of course, immediately we know that the relationships between Dalits and food is unlike the relationship between any other group in, in, in this country and food. That you're coming across a new kind of understanding of what is hun hunger, what is the kinds of foods that are available, what are the practices around food, what is the humiliation involved in food, what is the delight involved in food. Uh, everything has a, has a new, new kind of aura around it. They interview these people and there are biographies that uh, are included in this. The biographies are in Marathi and they're also translated into English. And they take from each person a recipe. Uh, a recipe of what she likes to cook best. But, and uh, well, there's one man as well, the recipe of what he likes to cook best. In the meanwhile, they go to the bookshops in Pune and they look through the shelves and they look at the cookery books. So they're doing original research. They look for their archive of they're doing, a, a, they're doing a cookery book themselves, so they search out an archive of cookery books, and they do a critique of the kind of cookery books that are about available on the shelves in Pune. And then they come back and they put this material, they write it up, they have to, what has been recorded has to be written up, it has to be translated, they create a kind of introduction to this activity, there are reflections on memory work, there are reflections on caste and gender, there's reflections on uh, food and uh, the politics of food, and they write all this up into this uh, extremely engaging document uh, with small introductions, and the document is partly in Marathi and partly in English. Now, of course, uh, everyone here is either a research scholar <coughs> or a teacher, and I don't need to point out to you what are the skills of original research, reading, thinking, analysis, connection with the world, uh, uh, ethnography, and, and so on, and as well as critical engagement with received material that comes through this class. But what is most brilliant of all, what is most brilliant of all as far as I'm concerned in this class, is the fact that this is a task that the actually existing student can do with enjoyment, all right, and learn something from it. How, how does that calibration, where the calibration that allows you to produce a task that is doable, and from which you can actually learn and train yourself. So I'm, I'm sorry, 
we didn't have time to learn more from Sharmila's experiments. I think these are, uh, in one sense, uh, an inheritance which we have to take forward and work with further. And I want to say again that I, I started by saying, Isdasan will always be my teacher. And I want to close this by saying that there is a sense in which these books, these little <laughs> works by Sharmila, are also teaching us how to be teachers. Uh, let me add. We can learn from each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I put it up now? <laughs> Thank you, Suzy. And uh, you could have spoken more. I, I'm sure you have so much to say. And, but uh, but you are you are also concerned about others' intellectual well-being. So you just finished before time. Suzy. Oh, good. <laughs> before time? Two minutes, huh? Okay. Uh, the point that she is raising for all of us to ponder is about this, uh, see her critique of uh, old style pedagogy, which has to be thrown out of window. And I agree with her. I mean, this, this is so dysfunctional that we just can't produce anything meaningful out of this. And actually we can uh, deploy this uh, pedagogy at the cost of really distancing ourselves from both the content and the people who hold this content. So that's a very good warning. And then the other one is, and then she's situating the whole new pedagogy of Sharmila in terms of the deficiency and limitations of the old pedagogy. Uh, so we felt it very earnestly in Delhi, and my friend from Delhi will agree with me. Uh, we are also constructed in such a way that you know we have no connection with what is happening with food and other things. You get our uh, uh, language straight away from uh, France and Germany and not so much from America and from England, but um, England and uh, France, that's it. And we have our recipe is different. Uh, not <laughs> yeah, so. And the other point Susie is making is about uh, the institutions are performed by people both inside and outside. That's a wonderful line of thinking. And uh, certain amount of and then she is qualifying performativity as it is showcased is not the performativity we are talking about. We are actually performing in order to really search meaning both in ourselves and also enrich the meaning of institutions. So that's a much more trans transcendental meaning that we are looking for. So that is another important point Suzy is making. And I must th thank Suzy for really uh, 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 making these two important points in the context of remembering Sharmila and in terms of our very, very innovative pedagogy. I have something to say, but I don't have time at this moment. I'm so kambakar that I can't really speak on her today. And then I'll say, but, but now I'll uh, request uh, uh, Sanjay, you are the one. Now you want to. I, I need to uh, introduce Sanjay. Sanjay has been our student, and I, have, I spent little time in Pune University, and uh, actually a good time in Pune University when Sharmila was around, her team was around. Sanjay was a, stu was a student and uh, Sanjay uh, uh, came from the uh, background where you have uh, this kind of, uh, what say, uh, the term that they, they say, and I'm just using that term with also everybody's permission. <coughs> University is normalized structure run by rules set by people who are elitist. <coughs> And therefore, whosoever is coming, OBC, Dalit, Adivasi, minority, to the structure, they are, I mean, uh, they are, they are lawless, but they are lawful as well. So that unruly, as you are mentioning, is the one, and, and, and a lot of students from Marat Fadda and Vedasba now who are storming into the city, the script is being changed in Pune. Sanjay is one, one of those students who is changing the script uh, in Pune University, and I will read his uh, biography. Sanjay uh, works at the Kanti Jyoti Savitri Bhai Phule Women's Studies Center at the Pune, University of Pune. And as part of this uh, center, and uh, this team, uh, he had been closely associated with Professor Shemila Rege, who joined the center in 91. Uh, he was, uh, he's doing his PhD, is it over? No, he's, he, he's doing his PhD, I thought he was over, it was over. Um, I'm anticipate. Caste, class, and gender in Maharashtra since 1970s, with special reference to Comrade Sharath Patil and Gail Ahmed and Rao Sapkar, very difficult. 
Uh, uh, he has published several articles in research journals and he has been published, he has published a book titled Caste and Census, Census, a critic of mainstream sociology in India and co edited a book, uh, Youth Cultures, uh, Defamiliarizing the Family, a very interesting title and he has also written so many other articles in Marathi, uh, in uh, in what so well, I have come up with those and those very insightful. <coughs> it's intellectually agile and that's the contribution of Marathwada to Kanti Jyoti uh, Savitri Bhai Phule Center. Uh, is that enough or should I say more about you? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I am presenting my paper on Sharmila Regge's contribution, organic and dialectical relations with study, theorization and lived social processes. In the absence of Regge Madam, it is very sad moment to speak and listen to her. We have never imagined this type of the sad demise of her. In last some years, we lost some very important intellectual scholars like Dina Muzumdar, Lothika Sarkar, Babra Babur, Professor Ram Bapad, and recently, Om Prakash Varmiki and Namdeod Sar. But I'm very thankful to organizers of the seminar by keeping this special session on remembering Professor Sharmila Regi, past gender and pedagogy. Sharmila Regi has influenced two generations in Maharashtra and outside who dedicated to uh, transformatory politics and believers of social responsibility. She was the symbol of civilized, ethical, and good educational culture. She was not only an extraordinary scholar, writer, and teacher, but also friendships nurtured by her are a precious treasure for her friends and acquaintances. Along with being loyal to her own ideological stand, she de dedicated her entire life for students, endowed with rationality, modesty, conscientious uh, stands, and empathy, Reggie Madam was distinguished in Dalit as well as non-Dalit community. Affection for her is a matter of honor and contentment for many. I was amazed when Professor Sharmila Reggie, who was head of the Department of Sociology, decided to join as director and reader in Kranti Jyoti Sahitya by Pune Women's Study Center, University of Pune. In hierarchical institutions, such as university, a scholar established in the mainstream discipline switching for lower positions shows her commitment towards women's studies. There is a tendency among scholars to identify an area which is fashionable as it extracts more funding according to the topicality of the theme. Sharmila Regi engaged her academic pursuits as a juvenile endeavor which she felt by her, by her heart to, putting caste in the feminist framework and engaged with it critically <coughs> without undermining the contemporary socio-political process in her perspective. In her short lifespan, she wrote many landmark works. Since days her as student, she had an inherent spirit of researchers. In the introduction to the book, Sociology of Gender, published in 2003, Sharmila Regge talks about how sociology is critiqued from feminist thoughts while talking about change in sociology in 60s and 70s due to feminist frameworks and studies. Regge talks of how feminist awakening took place all over the world how established the discipline of sociology was looking at opening up of social sciences and how it was ghettoizing women's studies in the frame of knowledge of the women, by the women, for the women, is shown by Reggae. Taking a review of previous reports, how the lit and feminist movement and knowledge acquired through movement was banging the doors of knowledge in sociology, it's underlined by Reggae. Sharmila Reggae used to say that if one wants to think about society and act on it, one can't forget the reference of caste, class, and gender. By teaching to the students in sociology and women's studies, gave a new perspective to understand theory, concept, and analysis, urging students to take a stand while analyzing researchers, professors, and students from other universities and colleges have benefited from her knowledge, guidance, and diligence. She insisted, she insisted that one should not ignore the complexity in society and the multidimensional social reality. She used to say, persons or organizations should be firm while taking any stand, but that firmness should not mean obstinacy. In last two decades, uh, decades saw, the, uh, saw the emergence and assertion of separate Dalit Bahujan women's movements 
both at the national and regional levels. This assertion against their exclusion and political and cultural spheres sought to transform Dalit and feminist politics in India. In the same decade, anti mandal protests saw upper caste youth mourning the death of merit and publicly endorsing endogamy. The reproduction of caste in modern spaces like universities, bureaucracies, and women's movements and studies was thus apparent. The assumptions about caste identities being private and personal were called into question and serious <coughs> challenges posed for understanding caste and gender in contemporary India. Located within this context, writing caste, writing gender brings together extracts from Dalit women writers of Maharashtra. Sharmila Riggis, writing caste, writing gender creates a milestone in the approach of looking at history from below, supporting the overpowering voices of Brahminical patriarchy. Her last book, published in January, uh, 2013, Against the Madness of Mono, brings together Ambedkar's writing sound, Brahminical Patriarchy, producing Ambedkar's scholarship as an indispensable, invaluable resource for feminism. Sharmila's work has opened up the hotlines between caste and gender in ways that are not amenable to easy uh, resolution. Pro uh, Professor Pratima <coughs> Patrici, a well-known feminist activist, is absolutely right in saying that Sharmila was an example, uh, exemplar of how to continue selfless pursuit of truth and knowledge and apply the products of knowledge to the everyday life of the common people. Sharmila's real contribution lies in her drawing the critical feminist discourse into the Dalit, Dalit movement and the feminist movement. Sharmila untiringly endeavored to avoid the ghettoization of the Dalit and gender questions and to get the Satyashodak agenda into the mainstream of social science discourse. To achieve this, she tried to build bridges with the Dr. Ambedkar Academy, the Vidrohi Cultural Movement, the Satyashodak Vidyarthi Sangatna, and became organically linked to them all, not just as a sympathizer but as a real activist, one with them. Fully Ambedkarite Methodological Perspective. <coughs> While calling herself Fully Ambedkarite, she developed a feminist methodology on the basis of her principles of prajna, friendship, empathy, and justice which she also used in her dialogue with others. Afterwards, in 2008, she included Pule Ambedkarite perspective in teaching and accepted them as Pradna means critical understanding, empathy means sahabhavna, love and freedom. Her curiosity, erudition and dedication were not limited to academics. <coughs> Scholarly curiosity or exercise was not the only foundation of them. The impulse for all her philosophical and intellectual efforts <coughs> was fundamental transformation in social relations. She believed that if one wants to give meaning to life, then one should repudiate individualism and egoticism to change personal and social relations, was her belief. If this is to happen, social equality, justice, and democracy should be established. Differences based on class, religion, caste, and gender should be eradicated to end classist, racial, casteist, commun uh, communal, and patriarchal dominance. There is no other option than socio-political struggle was her firm belief. She believed that by building the movements and organizing agitations, it was foundation of knowledge and knowledge production is itself a movement. She did not agree to the distinction between movement, academic theorization and practice. She had not limited her understanding of the in interrelation between theory and practice in writing, but internalized it to all facets of her life. Prime contribution of Sharmila Rege was the building of the center, which ideologically, ideological energy to all disciplines in uh, university and to Satya Shodak Vidrohi Dalit Bhujan Women's Movement. <coughs> Sharmila Rege, in her article Feminist Pedagogy and Sociology for Emancipation in India, believes that feminist pedagogy explicitly confronts the popularly understood divisions between public and private, between reason and emotion, and legit uh, legitimizes personal experience as an appropriate arena of intellectual activity. It is recognized that teachers and students alike bring texts of their own to the classroom, which shape the transactions within it. The teacher is only the main contributor and delineator, not the sole authority. Pedagogies such as the feminist ones, which are the voice and explore the unexpressed and marginalized perspectives have to be collaborative, cooperative, and interactive. This requires that concepts be treated not as given, but that common vocabularies be built by making explicit connections between theory, research, and experience. For feminists, located as they are in the positioning of being both insider and outsider to the discipline, the explicit connections between theory, research, and experience 
lead towards gender sensitive perspectives and feminist pedagogies. Sermular again says that feminist pedagogies raise the important questions about how knowledge has been or is constituted by whom, for whom, and for what purpose, and answers to these are sought through the interrelations and mediations between personal experience, subject area, and its social and political contexts. In the Indian context, feminist pedagogies have to initially encounter the androcentrism of our discipline and subsequently feminist critics. Further, as sociologists trained in English with little indigenous <coughs> feminist theoretical discourse to base ourselves on, it is not easy to locate oneself amidst contestations of caste, classes, patriarchies, and communal identities. Standpoints that homogenize women as an analytical category do not hold ground in the Indian context. A feminist standpoint of interlocking operations that would recognize the complex mediations between caste, class, ethnic, and gender operations would be more connected to the living and the concrete. In a multi-caste class uh, religion classroom, a conscious attempt needs to be made to give political value to daily life. That is, feminist pedagogies uh, that we underline bring up a series of issues <coughs> pertaining to vulnerability, authority, and power in classroom. Her contribution to Dalit studies has been to argue for Dalit studies as an intervention in the field of knowledge and not merely as identitarian. She has argued, therefore, that the studies pushes one to relook at the conceptual, theoretical, and methodological frameworks of social sciences in general. Drawing on theoretical contributions and perspectives from the academic borderlands, territories that lie between activism and academia, where knowledge claims of multiple marginalized groups intersect, converge, and contest, Sharmila Rege has crafted a rich and productive challenge to mainstream sociologies of gender and caste. She has brought passion and political commitment to her efforts at engendering sociological discourse in India, pushing gender studies beyond simple disaggregating or pluralizing approaches towards a fundamental and ongoing reconceptualization of disciplinary units, boundaries, and structures. Sharmila Rege's contribution lies in unpacking essentialist categories that make up mainstream sociological and women's studies scholarship, and in her painstaking work to historicize and situate the interlocking structures of operation in the working of gender, class, and nation. She has explored discursive modes and strategies through which these structures are constructed without neglecting their historical and material underpinnings. I will skip some of the points. Yeah, this, those comments you can skip. Uh, classroom was the... Uh, Sermela Reges scholarly concerns have grown out of and been informed by anti-caste and women's movement of the past decade. And her efforts have been to bridge the gulf between these arenas by bringing the perspective developed in these moments into the academic moments through publications, teaching, and curriculum development. Classroom was the target of transformation for her. Acquisition of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge through new research and ideological re recharging of the progressive moments was the aim of her life. She worked for it till, till her death. She knew the teacher should constantly study herself. She did not believe in your single way of transformation, thus used to think over about how the feminist and Marxist moments can help one to understand the complexities of social reality and also dis uh, disangle them. She has firm belief on Dr. Ambedkar's thoughts for next generations. Education is the milk of tigress, and so classroom was the target of transformation. She never thought for sake of teaching. She used it to give reference to students about how a problem is developed, what is contemporary stage of pro problem, what researchers are done so far on the problem. Speciality of her pedagogy was to teach students with the help of audiovisual mediums like films, documentaries, etc. The lectures used to be bilingual, Marathi as well as English. Her lecture used to continue for two and a half to four hours. She constituted a team of teaching associate who used to be present at the time of lectures. When I was teaching associate, I saw she used to give answers to the question within a moment uh, with her own specific stand. I am happy that I got this opportunity. Sharmila Rege composed a bridge course to bridge the gap between knowledge and skills. If knowledge and skills are exchanged by urban and rural as well as Marathi and English speaking students, then it will be beneficial for both was her idea. With changing social uh, situation, the pedagogy also changed. Sharmila accepted a pedagogy which will be in the harmony with modernity. 
which have an understanding of the changing social character of classroom without an ego and selfish motives built on self -reflect reflectivity. Hence, we all got engaged in women's studies. Uh, there are um, there were other professors like uh, Sujata Patel uh, and Horchis uh, uh, Sharmila Rege. When I was a student uh, taken uh, admission at that time, these two uh, professors I saw, and we uh, we the students from rural area are linked with Ram Bapat, Professor Ram Bapat and her legacy uh, in Professor Sharmila Rege. But we do not and never. Uh, uh, connected with Professor Sujata Patel. Okay, <laughs> hence, we, uh, uh, hence, we all got engaged in women's studies. She was punctual. For a lecture of two hours, she used to read for seven to eight hours, she used to take new notes, but she never taught with the written points in front of her. What is inverse of thoughts? What is the history of man's efforts to understand and change human life? She used to explain it through concepts, methodology, and Dalit feminist perspective. We used to feel like it's an ex excursion through the universe of thoughts. Establish the theories in social sciences should be interrogated. Using questions arise from situation where we experienced them. She created that confidence and theorized on that standpoint. While thinking about any event or problem, it's necessary to think fundamentally and complete. It is necessary that thinking and studies should have close links with progressive transformatory thoughts and one should ideologically intervene in public life. This key is given by her to students. She used to read each and every word written by a student in research, listen to them and used to prescribe some references, points and books. Not, nothing is worth throwing away that every subject can be researched, that there are possibilities is everything which can be saved through intensive hard work and her firm belief. She used to discuss about researchers openly, honestly and clearly and used to offer important suggestions. She used to invite national and international scholars to classroom <coughs> seminars so that students should get acquainted with their knowledge and work. Over and above, she used to invite leaders and activists through different moments. She was Earnings to deliver knowledge to students and to enrich them from different streams. The universe of knowledge in women's studies should be enriched and made accessible for Marathi readers. Hence, she translated key works in Marathi. The issues being discussed in Marathi but not in English were also translated by her in English. Getting closer to 20 minutes. Huh? Dalit feminism, uh, she has faced a virulent critic also. Dalit feminism, popular culture and higher education were her favorite topics. She faced a lot of critic on her Dalit feminist standpoint. She was part of editorial team about social, social edition related to the women's studies in economic and political weekly in March 2013. Her editorial writing faced a virulent critic. It was said that this editorial is stealing Dalit feminist voice. But though she was not Dalit by birth, she accepted Dalit feminist perspective and was proponent of it. The critics should understand that it is easy to take down non-Dalits through such criticism. In a Diwali magazine, Sharmila Rege argued, in the wake of 21st century, international feminist perspective generated from Dalit women struggle and their pro programs will be the only emancipatory uh, standpoint. She has done a very important study of Dalit and Dalit feminist movement in India. While suggesting Urmila Power to write a book on Dalit women, Sharmila Rege organized a workshop for publishers and authors of book, where I discharged the function of coordinator. All the Dalit women writers were uh, congregated for the first time. Many of them had seen University of Pune for the first time. She did not talk in the workshop to give opportunity to writers to talk. All were given opportunity to talk, including Rao Saik Kasbe, Vidud Bhagwat, Pradhna Daya Pawar, and Manohar Zado. She declined to write preface for book and insisted writer Gurmila Pawar should lead the torch. When Chaya Dadar wrote an article, non brahmin renderings of feminism in Maharashtra, is it, is it a more emancipatory force? Raise questions about Dalit feminism and pleaded that eco-feminism is more useful than Dalit feminism. 
Then you encounter similarity strongly defended their position through article real, real feminism and Dalit women, scripts of denial accusation. Sharmilarege has forwarded an important Dalit feminist perspective in India. Sharmilarege asserted that colonial reformist movement had tried to enhance the situation of oppressed sections of society on the basis of caste abolishing judiciary. Post-colonial feminists overlooked this fact and highlighted how all reforms were wasted. Consequently, theoretical scholars belonging to this tradition have remained estranged from colonial Pulayambarkarite movement. They then see the new Dalit feminist voice as just another difference in the difference, a difference framework informed by postmodernism that overlooks the crucial questions of inequality is Shermila's main argument. It is, it will be erroneous to frame Dalit feminist, uh, feminist voice. Yeah, you can read uh, some important paragraph, you can read and just conclude. Uh, you want to say something? You have said so many important things now. You want to say something finally? Something you written? Uh, if Sharmila did not like something or disagreed, she used to react within, uh, with forbearance and firmness. She never used to tone up dislike. Reaction has never shown ego. Contrary, other person never felt, never felt her. <coughs> she had not to show disagreement without hurting others. She was inclined to inform, uh, inclined to forming contacts with people and nurturing them. She used to ensure that nobody is getting hurt because of her. She never emphasized the fact that she is a scholar and she never expected compliances. But she always guarded her self-respect. She was a scholar, deeply aware of the nuances of the situation. Sharmila's <coughs> diligence, reflection, and reading were astounding. In this era of specialists and super-specialists, depth of the knowledge in some specific field goes on increasing. <coughs> but awareness of the broader and interrelation between different subjects goes on diminishing. It may create hurdles in creation of nuanced understanding of the life society and universe. But Sharmila Rege always had this comprehension and thus she was always conscious about the developments in many disciplines and their <coughs> effects on human lives. Hence, she completed, uh, contemplated on what should be pedagogy and how to achieve correlation of gender studies and sociology, gender studies and cultural studies, and gender studies and daily studies. Sharmila Rege used to ask after students as well as their family members. She used to take precaution that nobody should feel uncomfortable or face difficulty. Because of this temperament, relations with her were, were always affectionate. Dialogue with new generation and affection with older ones was a facet of her personality. She had a huge circle of acquaintances. She befriended many with her tolerant and honest nature. Everyone around her used to feel that he or she is special for her. <coughs> Only few people can achieve this. Sharmila was my friend and teacher, director, supervisor for last 10 years in Pune University. I will. Sanjay, you take it. No, no. Drink some water. Have some. Yeah, drink some water. It's alright. You want to stop here? Stop. I would fill the. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's difficult to make a presentation about some scholar who is so dear to you. So one can see their emotions uh, exploding ultimately. He's trying to control. I'm also not able to control my emotions. So that's the. Uh, you, you want me to read this? Okay. When Sharmila Rege, and this is his statement, uh, 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 when Sharmila Rege was in the hospital, she had asked her colleagues to put up a song on Ambedkar beside her dead body. And she had also asked uh, to keep her ashes uh, 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 near Bhima Korega uh, um, uh, uh, memorials of the Mahar soldiers so fought uh, for the social emancipation of the Dalit community. They actually fought against Brahmanism in 1818 at Bhima Korega. 
and those inscriptions. So see, this is what Sharmila is. She has uh, such a strong emotional, historical attachment. You know, this is something which never, I, no one could imagine. So this is what he, uh, Sanjay is uh, writing about, uh, about our last wishes. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and then uh, various Dalit organizations paid tribute to Sharmila Rege by saying that the Dalit movement had lost his strong supporters. So that's his, uh, uh, that's his final, uh, you know, uh, final uh, feelings about Sharmila and her, her feelings about the Dalit government and Dalit history, Dalit uh, revolutionary history. That's what you want to say. Uh, Sanjay, uh, uh, you are making several points and uh, opening up to us uh, multifaceted uh, pro-students and pro-cause uh, pro uh, of commitment of Sharmila Rege. And uh, those two points I would like to share with you. One is about, and this is the point that we are raising from the first day, that who can speak, the representation question, who can speak for whom? And uh, there is a debate, and there is a debate which is also colored, ideologically colored, people don't want to speak, people are not allowed to speak and things like that. There is a very contested political terrain. But one thing I should share, and Shamila and uh, uh, Padeep and uh, uh, Umesh and uh, they will, all, of, all the Marathi people agree with me, of course, Aparna, uh, that Sharmila enjoyed the rare distinction of being the organic intellectual. That everybody accepted her across caste. And uh, this was actually uh, a very rare quality. And then you can see that obituary is, uh, uh, you know, made by people coming from different corners and different ideological backgrounds. This is, uh, this is something which is a very rare thing that one can achieve in one's lifetime. And lifetime which is actually intersected by so many other uh, impulses. The other point is uh, to learn from Sharmila is to, uh, uh, whatever I can, one could gather from uh, Sanjay's presentation, uh, was about uh, the uh, <coughs> How, new pedagogy, how to separate ideology and intellectual epistemological pursuit. <coughs> how to separate being politically correct and being politically active. And I actually learned it from her. Uh, because most of the time, and in Jainu, Jainu of course is a very prominent example, ideology doesn't allow you to, to, to do anything. It really is so disenabling. You are already, already, always constituted by these ideologies. But she says she is not saying goodbye to ideology. But that that comes only later. And what a Dalit or a minority or Adivasi or anybody <coughs> is supposed to do is to really be ideological but suspend it. She would say, "Don't, don't come with, go, don't come to my class with slogans. Read." Make, a, make an argument. And that uh, was her uh, very important contribution. Let us not pamper Dalit students or any student with this ideologically syllable and uh, syllable uh, uh, slogans. Uh, so, but we have many of them in Pune because Pune is the center of power. So you have people jumping around. They have slogans and solutions, but they don't have arguments. That she taught people to really take arguments seriously and methodology is fully Ambedkar and Sahatri fully and others, the non Ramanikam. Uh, so these are two important contributions made by Sharmila to all of us. And so thank you, uh, Sanjay, for your very, very uh, uh, emotionally involved, uh, intense, uh, intensified experience actually uh, with uh, her own uh, intellectual trajectory. I have something to say about what. I was also there when she was on the, uh, in the hospital. But these are all touching moments, and I won't go into it. So, Ras uh, Swati. Wait, Swati. Where is your? Huh? It's here. <laughs> okay, uh, Swati has a very, uh, um, uh, 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 very, very intense interaction with her. See, she had interaction with her. She was an editor of UPW Special Issue on. Dalit, Dalit feminism and Swati contributed a very, very interesting, important article in uh, CPW. You must be knowing it's May 2012. Uh, is it 2012? 
Dr. Swati Margaret completed her PhD from IFLU and she also doesn't require much interruption. Maybe for the new students you require? Nobody knows you? Okay. Uh, uh, her doctoral thesis was titled Gandhi and the Question of Caste. Very, very important. A study of select Telugu and English fiction and cinema. Uh, I haven't seen that uh, book yet so far. Uh, she em engages with uh, form form formations and formulations of, sorry for my ignorance, huh? a new term. Uh, she engages with formations and formulations of feminism within Dalit discourse. She is also a research fellow at Anveshi, at Rabha. She also has written extensively on the inter intersection of caste and gender. Uh, some of her publications include uh, cultural cultural Gandhism, casting out the Dalit women, and has edited a special issue on Insight <coughs> Journal, where I, have, I also have the receiving, I'm also at the receiving end, I guess. And but you are not mentioned in EPW article. Uh, okay, so but I have seen her article in EPW recently, <laughs> along with uh, many others, many other important people. That is Sharmila and uh, Mary and others uh, uh, edited that one. So with this, I think I should request. Uh, <coughs> You and uh, I don't mind if I really leave with you in the mid in the middle of the morning. It's only close the come close up. Please have your own time. I'll try to yeah, I'll, I'll try to make it as brief as possible because uh, I'm, I I've titled this dialogue with Dalit women, a feminist initiative, which I'm very good. Uh, after this rich tribute paid by Mr. Sanjay to Sharmila, uh, I would want to carry forward the spirit in which uh, Sharmila Reddy has interacted with Dalit feminist intellectual work. Intellectual does not necessarily mean uh, women within academia, but also uh, women who wrote uh, Jalsa's songs and other cultural forms. It's always um, heartening to acknowledge her life, her contribution to new knowledge production, to academia, to women's studies, to me personally, in my thinking and research since I first read her uh, EBW article in 1999. Um, she calls, her, calls herself, as we all know, uh, an Ambedkarite feminist, which has the power to immediately connect with it is her deep lifetime engagement with Dalit women and their work that uh, gives hope for further dialogue. Um, she, she, she's, after uh, Urmila Pawar wrote her, um, we, we too were making history in 2000, um, 1989 and her view of life uh, 2003. I mean to say she was responding to the Dalit feminist articulations of uh, the gaps within uh, uh, feminist renderings. Uh, <coughs> I'm calling this a dialogue, uh, not just with Sharmila Reke, but with feminism itself, that, that it women's um, a dialogue is to allow all parties involved to speak fully, completely, and listen attentively in an atmosphere of mutual trust, respect, and equality. This has always not been the case with when it comes to Dalit women's relationship with um, mainstream feminism or progressive feminist groups. Um, so this is something very new, the method she has uh, consistently, you know, it's one thing to be good and it's another thing to be authentically uh, with a kind of conviction to engage only with respect. She, 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 she has brought in it as a method. Her method is attentive, active listening to Dalit women. There are feminists who wonder why Sharmila should now make Ambedkar a feminist hero for today's feminist movement to engage with caste question or to begin to think about 
uh, think aloud about differences among women based on their caste class locations. Sharmila faced open hostility and disapproval from feminists running gender studies departments because of the way she foregrounded positionality, her own location in terms of caste. For her, that's the only authentic way of dealing with the caste problem. She consistently refused to remain aloof and disengaged with the caste privilege she was born into. And also she resisted being, to put it in her own words, frozen in guilt. It is a complicated terrain to straddle the two social categories of caste and gender. Yet, what makes Sharmila's engagement unique and worth studying is her courage and her willingness to see the blind spots <coughs> sanctioned by class and caste and education. She talks about the feminist alliances with Brahminical power and privilege, which reflected in feminist canons. Sharmila writes, a large part of the feminist discourse of experience has been an autobiography of the upper caste woman, her conflict <coughs> with tradition, and her desire to be modern. Uh, now, why is it difficult for upper caste women to listen to what Dalit women speak? To understand this, historically, uh, upper caste womanhood is put on a pedestal, defined as being different from both the uh, English woman as well as the lower caste woman. If we, because women's education has its um, beginnings in the nationalist reform, uh, one really wondered whether uh, feminist, uh, feminism has moved away from the nationalist legacy. Because if you look at the blurbs of these <coughs> important books brought out by progressive feminist circles, you see um, quotations by Mahatma Gandhi and the contributions made uh, by him for women's emancipation. Um, that was um, an ideological ompus which <coughs> acted as a hindrance for the women to connect with mainstream progressive feminism. <coughs> Since we are talking about dialogue and if we mean uh, if we mean if you think of <coughs> politics in terms of relationships, partnerships, and alliances in the cont context of caste untouchability, we need to confront questions regarding relationship with one's own body and with other bodies, male, female, upper caste, Dalit, able, disabled, sick, ill, etc. How does one, there are only a few questions I would want to throw up for discussion, for further thinking. Because in 2007, I remember your papers where you were proposing um, alliance between Dalit groups and feminist groups based on the experience of untouchability. At that point, I asked, um, there is a strange kind of exclusion there. You were delineating about how the three days menstrual uh, period puts uh, upper caste women as an untouchable. Uh, and Dalit body remains untouchable uh, always. But the, in that moment of experiencing of untouchability, um, you know, it could be a potential space for uh, alliance building. Yes. At that time, um, um, you know, it, it, it was, tr yes, it, it is a possibility, but it's also troubling because uh, why is it that Neither uh, uh, Dalit movement nor feminist movement is not able to forge that kind of alliance with Dalit women. And I was thinking, I was, you know, I was reading um, uh, Shabila again against the madness of Manu and uh, Ambedkar's writings and how um, Hindu court bill and um, things about reform about marriage, divorce, and property. Uh, 
and later on, uh, for annihilation of caste, the uh, kind of ideas that Ambedkar proposes were intercaste marriage and intertimely. Now, in a heterosexual casteist society like India, uh, I think that I think that is the crux, uh, according to my mind. Uh, this alliance building is thought between Dalit men and upper caste women, which by design excludes Dalit women. So now, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not easily prescribing something. I'm not saying, um, you know, uh, how do we bodily, uh, how do we develop alternate bodily practices or, uh, you know, uh, within the multitude of uh, habits, thought patterns, uh, everyday practices that caste patriarchy has uh, ordered in our lives. How does one deal with one's relationship, one's own body, it, the, 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 the very um, conflictual terrain of the body, one's own body image and the various denigrating <coughs> cultural images of the body that are constantly produced and a certain kind of body, female body is elevated. How do we make a life, because at the end of the day, throughout the day and the night, we live in our bodies. So. <coughs> Even in a society where marriage or love between men and women of different castes is seen as an aberration, an anomaly, a certain kind of anomaly that needs to be corrected and the need for reclaiming the lost honor as a result, um, uh, lost honor because of this marriage by murder and various other forms of shaming and humiliation. Now, in inter-caste marriage or inter-caste love, when a Dalit boy and an upper caste woman elope, it is the uh, Dalit woman's body who bears the consequences of this love because they are paraded nakedly, they are uh, shamed, you know. It's a strange situation. The Dalit woman is not participating, you know, in, a, in, a, in an active, real bodily sense in, in this whole act, but she is punished. How does Dalit groups and how do we go about understanding these things? <coughs> now, I've come across David House develops a notion of touch as a different kind of bodily knowing, obscured or silenced by Cartesian dualism through the concept of skin knowledge. In our context, it is not the Cartesian dualism, but Brahminical patriarchy, which um, orders touch or non-touch. <coughs> now, if skin knowledge refers to a form of intelligent bodily knowing or understanding, I can give you any number of examples. If you if you think of Kailanji, uh, uh, for example, the whole Mangi family and the whole spectacle that is made out of the violence over Dalit woman's body. Um, when property right, when one is talking about property rights, for example, uh, sometime back you were referring uh, that the whole Dalit community is feminized because when they acquire property, violence is inflicted on the whole community. of the questions that are uh, troubling me and we can further uh, during the discussion with you. Yeah, I'm happy that you have raised the question about me and I answered it as well. So, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. No, no, you are perfect. Absolutely within 10, 15 minutes only. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a super, there is a super, so the remote control sitting there. So after looking at her, she's not doing anything. Okay, uh, uh, Swati has raised uh, important points, and some of them have some overlapping uh, uh, implications for Shemila's positions and us. And uh, uh, Swati has been a very serious interlocutor of, uh, uh, should I say, Dalit patriarchy? Uh, Okay, but I, I grant that point, and I, I would I have made this point several times. That since uh, <coughs> Mishra was speaking about 
this one reading about Dalit Patriarchy, Dalit Patriarchy has not been given any concession to be read differently. And therefore, there is a linear reading of uh, Dalit Patriarchy, which is fine, I have no problem. But when I said, and I think Sanar, you are also making the point in the earlier topic, okay, how Dalit community as a whole is converted into uh, femininity. Okay? And so, to that extent, I think uh, the, the, the <coughs> distinction, the division between Dalit women and Dalit male actually collapses. Because then, then they have no control on how they have no control on how they are being pursued and treated and uh, constructed by social patriarchy. I won't say primarily patriarchy now. Social patriarchy. I think we have to change that term. Now we have debate about it. It's not simply Brahmanical, it is also social patriarchy, which is actually going beyond Brahmanical. But retaining Brahmanical, going beyond it. So that's uh, one point. So uh, so your point has been, I mean, when we are, and this is 2007 in Goa, uh, uh, Pune also, Goa, I had a big problem. And, uh, maybe, I don't know whether this is even there now. Uh, I was actually ostracized by women. Uh, it's 700 women and only Mary and uh, uh, Sri Rekha and others were uh, actually protecting me, Sharmila and others were protecting me. What the hell is Dicha? Who is Dicha? Where is he coming from? Why is he speaking? And all those uh, existential questions are raised about me. So I was really like a, a mouse, it will be a disrespecting thing. But I was decimated almost. Uh, but then we came back. We came back. Oh, nothing like. So the question of untouchability, is it really contingent or temporal or it is also extendable? Uh, and therefore, why is that? And then you get, you get interesting uh, depth, interesting explanations. When I ask this question in Goa, uh, can you really treat that temporal uh, or, or accidental or incidental untouchability, four days, five days, as the condition to really make common cause with untouchability. So, the question is, the notion of untouchability is not the same, qualitatively. In terms of time and space, it is not the same, it is different. And therefore, I think there, there cannot be, uh, there, can there be a, uh, a unified uh, you know, condition within which we can forge this alliance. So, I am not very sure about it. I, I was just actually, when they, I, this was a tactical move on my part to say, are you, are, all women are Dari, that was my slogan. No, no, we are not. Repulsion. <coughs> I just wanted to test, as Ambedkar is testing all the time. The, he doesn't do anything about it, it's pragmatic, pragmatic move. Just to know, and he is also a, a barrister, no? Yeah. So he, a, he converts the whole thing into a court room situation, and in which he can, uh, engages with. He, does, he, he is not really at solving questions within the court room. Yeah. It's going beyond. That's why he's a system builder, like Fule. Uh, so, so that was one thing. But you know, point is this, and Sanal's point earlier. Can can we differentiate at more uh, uh, much much more uh, comprehensive level? Dalit patriarch, Dalit, Dalit male and Dalit female, as Dalit female, Dalit male and Dalit female, Dalit female, Dalit male, ah, yes. So, my understanding is, no, we can't, we, they converge at one level, because they are the victims of the exploitation, domination, social, of social patriarchy, they are, they are equally at the receiving end, but yet there is a differentiation, because Dalit also harass, torment, uh, dominate their own women. And I have been making this point in Hyderabad. The patriarchy is not democratic here. Yeah, sorry. By definition, it is not. It is the patriarchy can't be democratic. Not in degree even. It has to be. It has to be opposite. So that is one way of looking at it. So uh, Swati, you you are raising this difficult point, and I have no answer. I think. But uh, we have to deal with this linear reading. We are ruptured. I think. You can't leave. at some level. You can't have this reading because. They are, they are also converted into uh, women, that is. And, and Karnul, and I was in Karnul someday, uh, some three, three years back, and then they said, we are all treated as their women. Male will say. And since we are not transgress, we are transgressing, they did not like that transgression. And they were, they actually, they were so angry with us. As, as uh, our husbands, they were so, so, angry with us that we transgress. What is transgression? We contest the elections in Panchayat. One trans transgression. 
So when you have one particular image of the whole totality, <coughs> then I think these these differences actually lose their uh, hold, uh, their tenacity, their tenor, and therefore you have to move beyond. Uh, so that's one response to your long pending questions. This is a long pending question which she had with me. Uh, she wrote about it in Insight first and then I was told by all, oh, Swati Margaret has attacked you, sir. No, she has not attacked me anyway. <laughs> so, but I am happy to be attacked. Uh, so uh, I think I will stop here, Swati, with your permission. Uh, uh, so I, I need to go, oh, there is a cheat here. Uh, I'm saying you hand over this to Madhav and... Yeah, Madhav, you have to take over and I'm right. really extremely sorry that I have to really... Uh, and with my friend, of the I have to go and I'm very much interested. Maybe you can call me Madhav next time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this lovely uh, hospitality, intellectual treat, Thank you collegiality. Much. Yesterday's dinner was absolutely fabulous, though I was not a deep part of it. Uh, uh, but I enjoyed talking to students and I enjoyed the one uh, student, Priya, is, uh, will talk Priya about spirituality, not spirituality. Uh, so, uh, so, thank you very much. Okay. Oh. Okay. So have a nice um, okay. Should we? Uh, so we'll continue the session for another five six minutes, and then we have another thing. Uh, so I guess we should be have comments. Yes. Anybody who wants to say speak about Shamila? Oh. Um, share some memories or uh, contribute to the uh, ideas that have been put uh, out here. We have a few minutes. Yeah, please come here and... Uh, come, come here. Just sit there and uh, sit on the... This is uh, just out of my curiosity. I'm just asking uh, Dasan sir to know uh, what could be the reason to uh, the, those associations to form on the scheduled caste and uh, Adivasis. See, uh, Dalit is a term largely used in academia at the same time in the mass, you know, the movements. But why was uh, those people who were not interested to form a Dalit, uh, you know, emancipation or whatever the association and why could uh, why they are more interested in forming adivasi you know association you know welfare association it's not dangerous that's it. Uh, and one more to suzy um, when we offer courses in the universities like you know we are interested in offering courses based on you know whatever we read so far and you know whatever the courses we have done and whatever the little knowledge we gain <coughs> during those courses. But when we offer courses on Dalits and the tribes and the students which uh, who opt for those those courses, they uh, you know because you know we are part of the teaching and you know we face that you know they all the time you know treat us that you know these teachers are not having much theoretical background so that you know they offer these courses like you know where we can have you know kind of light discussion uh, that's where uh, you know I also I have taken uh, Anya sir's article for my course so students were saying that you know it is more uh, you know kind of historical uh, you know kind of thing it is not you know contemporary you know the issues which you know is going to address why have you taken since you are a tribe so you have taken this kind of these kind of comments we get, and you know when you're saying that you know the courses which you know the the, the faculties who are trying to manage pay, not taking the much much theoretical you know write-ups. So that's where I feel that you know where do we stand? At the one side we were treated that you know treated as teachers that you know not knowing much. At the other side we wanted to emancipate students who are not having a little knowledge of these Dalit or the tribes. So where do we stand? You know, we are you know, in, a, in a dilemma now. 
what kind of courses we offer to emancipate the other sections of the students in the universities particularly where nobody has a knowledge of you know the society or the social problems who are coming much much you know elite backgrounds and you know ridicule the teachers who offer this kind of courses <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Raji, for the question. If you look at the history of the category, then you will find that the state category is something docile and something passive and something harmless. But Dalit is a political category. And for uh, political parties, it is a threat. So they, they want to avoid it, they want to suppress it. And uh, the scheduled tribes in Kerala, they don't even constitute, they don't constitute even a, even a single person of population. Uh, Raju, you know I don't have any answers for you. Nobody has any answers. But I think that if we are able to look at experiments like this, now in this, in, in this experiment, students were actually researching <coughs> Dalit uh, knowledge about food, they were researching food, they were critiquing other ideas of food, <coughs> they were practically going out and meeting. So many things were happening that changed the student and it did not require of the teacher any great theoretical knowledge. The teacher and the student were together in the classroom creating this new, new knowledge and developing skills of criticism, reading, uh, research, documentation, archiving, uh, all kinds of skills were uh, are developed in what, is, what looks like a very simple and doable project. Now, I think the challenge for us is to move away from that traditional type of teaching, where you've got to know everything, where you know, you've got to know your Lacan, and you've got to know your Heidegger, and you've got to know, you know all those things. And, with which you uh, you pass it on, and some students are interested, and some students are not interested. But in this kind of teaching, we're looking at the actual historical situation in which we are. Right? Uh, teachers like you, who have come with uh, a great deal of struggle against a system which is dysfunctional, has not really given you enough, has not uh, been able to direct its attention at training you or equipping you or, or what. So you've come through, but you've not come through happy with what you have come through. You know, there is, you're happy that you're here, but you're not with, happy with what you've got. But that is the situation in which we are. Uh, how can we actually work with, the, with who we are, uh, who the students in our classroom uh, are, and what we can do to change the situation? So it requires very creative and very productive thinking. And this is one example. I found it a very exciting example of, of what can be done. Uh, because it has so many dimensions to it. It's not something that is undercutting or cutting short what should be an academic ambition. It has full-scale academic ambition. But it has a practicability, or an ability to reach out, an ability to repose questions of critique, of, uh, of uh, writing, of research skills in a way that is absolutely doable. And I think this, these kinds of experiments may have taken place in many places. It's not that this is the only one. The best thing about this is it's completely documented. Uh, and uh, so for us to document these things, to research other places, to put them together, these would be tasks to do. I don't think there's any one answer. but. You know, if I were to now paste up a keyword on my uh, study wall, it would be doable projects, that which is genuinely doable. Um, I think we'll uh, uh, kind of run out of time. In any case, what we did get a very uh, inspiring uh, sort of portrait of Sharmila in his professional contribution, life uh, and his contributions as a teacher and also a very really, uh, moving uh, portrait of her as a person, you know, from, from a student who uh, uh, studied with her and worked with her. So uh, with that, I think, uh, unless somebody has, anybody would like to say something uh, to add to it? Yes, please, please, quickly. Yeah. <coughs>
Please come forward. I remember the time when my mother had fallen ill and like the Women's Studies Center was uh, indirectly trying to get in touch with me uh, for her books on Bharatiya Samaj and Stri and the Fule Ambedkar and Stri Mukti Chit Sarvar. So I remember Sharmila before she kind of uh, really uh, was in the hospital and all getting in touch with me and trying to be so curious about uh, the whole movement of uh, uh, Fule Ambedkar and trying to ask me if I could, you know, use, uh, uh, she could use some of those passages for her own uh, reference and she had, I think, somewhere at one point assured my mother that she would be translating the whole thing of Bharati Samaj and Sri Jeevan. So I briefly remember that. Send, she sending her students to me in Bombay University who were interested in studying the course syllabus and seeing how much of women uh, oriented uh, syllabus we really deal with. So I think these are a couple of uh, things I remember. Sharmila organizing uh, this uh, seminar on uh, black poets and telling me that you have to come and speak about them. So I think these little, little I, it really showed her curiosity, her craving for knowing more and wanting to include and inculcate more in her coursework. Uh, I'll just respond to Raju's, uh, you know, uh, Quickly, yeah. Question very quickly. Uh, I was dealing with a course on African American women writing last semester, and I was just trying to contemporize it in the sense that I was trying to bring in the Dalit issue in India and trying to, you know, these are ways by which you can, uh, you may not specifically deal with a certain course, but there, there are ways in which you can relate. Uh, this semester I'm dealing with narrative verse, and I'm then going back to the Indian folk tradition and those artisans who actually come from the uh, grassroots who are uh, bringing in newer, uh, you know, who have shaped our contemporary understanding of narrative and so on. So I think there are ways in which you can really uh, deal with things like this in the class. You may not specifically talk about uh, uh, tribal art <coughs> as such, but you can kind of opt for courses which are correlative and then you can definitely put across your message to the students, I think. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very right. much. Just uh -huh. Yeah, please. Actually, we are now here in session for another 15 minutes to, uh, you know, we can continue, you know, if somebody has something to say, about, you know, uh, in continuation of this panel. But we are also trying, uh, wanting to sort of open up to all of you, all of you who have been here, not the necessarily the participants and, you know, those who have uh, papers, etc. But anybody who uh, would like to say something, you know, it's a kind of review, uh, session with uh, you know your comments, anything you feel uh, you know might have been done better, but uh, you know ought to have been done, etc. You know any any comments, uh, suggestions, etc. We would uh, welcome those, and that's uh, you know as long as we have time and uh, the force the, on the side permits, we will continue with this session. So please, yeah. Yeah, it's really great to have panel and. Uh, 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 I also you know, heard actually you know from one of her student about uh, her classroom experiments and you know, all that and, uh, and, 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 and we actually had a clear idea on uh, uh, our pedagogical you know, research methodology from this uh, uh, panel uh, discussion. See, um, I mean, she was actually, you know, for trying to um, uh, move away from, you know, existing pedagogical you know, recent uh, methodologies. As you know, uh, our pedagogical you know, research methodologies are either rabbinical or Eurocentric. <laughs> And these methods and you know, pedagogical practices are completely uh, anti downtrodden communities, subaltern communities, and unfriendly to these communities. If a person wants to do research on a particular community, you know, he cannot do with this existing uh, methodologies. He has to you know, adopt some other methodology. And uh, that is where uh, the, uh, 
Sermila use different kind of methodologies and all that. Of course, uh, our pedagogy and teaching, you know, so <coughs> aim is to disseminate knowledge. Then question is, what kind of knowledge you are disseminating? <coughs> if, if it is a Brahmin professor, you know, uh, 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 teach under the classical uh, uh, literature, <coughs> Vedas and you know, Puranas and all that. But now uh, we have just uh, uh, Suji has uh, shown us now what was actually taught under classical literature. Okay, so it's all depend on how a teacher actually adapt and uh, themes and you know, prepare curriculum and you know, uh, you know, teach that and then how to you know, engage with their student. There is actually a lot to learn from uh, Sharmila Saragis, unfortunately. See, left us very, very uh, early. Thank you. Very, uh, very quick and brief response again to this whole discussion about a relevant curriculum. Uh, there was apparently, and I'm reporting uh, uh, a task of learning about the uh, skewed gender ratio, the population. You know, there, there are too few women in India compared to men, and we obviously something is happening. So how do you set a task with which, how do the <coughs> students study this? Of course, they could read all the classics and read through EPW and read all. But the task that was set in the Women's Studies course classroom was to go back into your own family history and go back five generations and try to map how many men, how many women, what is the sort of population profile in your own family all the families in the classroom. And some absolutely stunning evidence comes up from what you are able to find out from your own family history. Now, of course, that you think of the, the pedagogic and academic value of such an exercise. There are so many things that it actually manages to do uh, in one stroke. And I was just thinking as Aparna was talking and as, uh, you know, Raju, uh, uh, and, and the tremendous respect I have for people like Raju, who is trying in a very difficult circumstance to be able to do something with his students. Uh, <coughs> maybe some kind of small group of young teachers should come together and uh, talk to each other every semester about how to structure their courses, or what can be done. Uh, and then you, there will be some support from each other also about difficulties that you encounter in class or problems that you come up with and so on. That it should be alone. It is very difficult to be so so creative. But uh, as a group, yeah. much more. Can be. Yes. Would uh, anybody like to? Yes, please. Sir, this is related issue with uh, just uh, just we are talking about. Uh, sir, if somebody offers the courses like the politics or the Ambedkar thought in in HC, I am talking about the HC. I am not uh, I am not uh, commenting my my <coughs> friends those who are from other class, but they say who should I take this course? What is there to talk? What is there to learn? If somebody will take, definitely it is for the mass. If I I mean take the tribal course or the the politics. I just now, then I will have a plus, a plus sir. It is the it is the mentality and it is the you know, psychological thing that is you know we are we are facing. One second thing at the same time when we are coming to a seminar or conference like this, saying that there is no such theoretics here, there is no such <coughs> philosophical thing, there is no such good work. How it is going to be theorized? So these are the questions that is very, very much, uh, very much important to for the academic itself. It is not just Sir Mila's uh, contribution, but it is the academician and academia that we are facing every day. If 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 the student goes to the philosophy and talks about the car, it is totally denied. No, how can you talk? These are the things happen. So because it was limited, that's why I have to mention. No, yeah, it is. An 
No, this has been a wonderful conference, uh, both in terms of its organization and uh, in terms of uh, the intellectual uh, uh, input. I was just wondering because of, uh, uh, I mean, it's also very unique because this is a conference which is really uh, used philosophy and brought us into thinking uh, theory and philosophy in a very uh, different way. I was just wondering whether there uh, could be a possibility to have, this is in re retrospect and it's not uh, really a criticism, but uh, could there be a possibility of having some basic readings which would give us some small vocabulary because um, three days of intense listening and realizing that uh, we're using so much of Indian and Western philosophy, I personally many times felt that I had question, but my maybe my uh, question would have sounded very uh, inadequate in terms of uh, formulation. So I was just wondering whether there is a possibility to uh, have a smallish kind of reading list. A reading group would have been very nice, but at least a small reading list. What? No? No, you can't raise your hand and uh, back off. <laughs> no, I was not raising actually. Well, that's so actually I was wondering, okay, uh, I mean, to talk about this conference actually I felt a little different than the the EFLU conferences organized. I, I don't want to actually give 100% certificate for this conference but <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm very happy that, you know, I sat continuously in these three days and I could listen everything and first time in my life. <laughs> you know, and uh, what, what except for one or two people. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I want to tell. I also have a criticism. So when my own conference, like department conference happened, I never stood, like I've never sat there. It was last year. See, uh, when we were talking this uh, Sarimala uh, Regis incident, see, I am talking as an activist perspective that though I was born as a Lombarda through the whole Hindu kind of perspective, I was always thinking about this Hindutva politics. And when I came to uh, CFL, till that time, like my seniors, like Venkat Rao, Raj Shekhar and all these people, maybe because of Suzy or someone, there was some kind of <laughs> understanding and you know, the ideology, though they were having you know, serious problems. Maybe at that time there was some kind of uh, readings and some kind of discussion was happening. But when it became IFLU and you see the change and there was only one organization and after that, like the teachers, those who have come are like those like are there now they never bothered about the activists or the students that's what I feel because I've been there since then <coughs> though I've been like I did my MA then I came PhD till I took uh, Satya Zambedkar course I didn't know what is actually you no know, Dalit politics and I did his course like last then I could at least understand <coughs> and you know because I was feeling always in the class Somebody is talking about critical technology and digital technology. Somebody is talking something, something. I really, I didn't feel like most of the Dalits and you know, tribals among our, our you know, activist friends, we really don't know what is exactly Dalit politics. And we are doing like uh, Gopal Guru was telling, like Sharmila Reges, like you ha should have some kind of ideology that doesn't mean that you shout and go to her class. So that is actually very like lacking if you like maybe like at least you you can give some kind of exper experiment like in the sense come with something like we really have a problem with you that's why that's why I last night yes, I asked you that question <laughs> <laughs> that's why I asked uh, insisted that you speak <laughs> okay uh, who else yes yes I have a <coughs> yeah Simon. I usually shy away from speaking. 
so uh, as Susi was mentioning some of the things happening in other places, I teach in a university in uh, Kote, and we have had at least in the last 10-15 years, uh, predominantly Dalit and poor OBC students in the social sciences department. But there in the uh, universities, in, in our university, nobody speaks about it in fact. So once I told uh, Gobal Guri jokingly that this is the right moment for the social sciences to emerge in Kerala, but it's not happening. So uh, I have had uh, on few occasions uh, to lis listen to Sharmila Raghi and also to uh, interact with her. Uh, that was the time when we had that Dalit intellectual collective. Uh, Gobal Guru was uh, very much the moving spirit behind that. And then uh, we used to have some conversations about this, but uh, in spite of all these conversations and interactions I personally had with uh, people outside Kerala, uh, we could never do much. Uh, there is perhaps, as uh, Professor Eshidasan said, there is some kind of built-in resistance to this. And then the, uh, the matter of the fact is that the social sciences have become completely open, to, not the other open social sciences open to Dalits, but nothing happens positively. I will say, when I say uh, that nothing happens positively, it doesn't mean that everything is bleak. So there are still possibilities, but this pedagogical intervention doesn't take place, you know. Uh, it's a huge task. You see, it is something to say that uh, X or Y uh, teacher does research and so on. That's different, but enabling a large number of students who really want to learn this and then uh, you see, when uh, I was a student, and I was sorry for uh, moving to a larger thing, uh, in, this, uh, in the late 70s when I got enrolled into the colleges, all those who would be in economics uh, class would be <coughs> dark and emaciated fellows. And uh, they would say that these are all economics people. And we never knew that there were great economists from India. But uh, we already knew that either you have Dalit Christian students or Dalit students in the economics class. And then uh, we all thought that what is this uh, economics all about? And then of course moving in social science, I, I came to know that economics is much serious. But then in Kerala, this had this sort of stigma. But nobody ever talks about this sort of, you know, built in which I would uh, call uh, institutional caste system, you know, as we say about institutional racism uh, looming large in other places. But in Kerala, this was very much there. Uh, to the extent that uh, whoever has come up there, it, it has happened to large amount of personal struggles. But now it is the right time where, you know, we can have a certain kind of uh, mobilization around these issues. But I'm, uh, as most of the things as this time, we don't have an immediate answer to this. But uh, in the context of uh, discussing Shamla uh, contributions, I think uh, this is a serious issue which is to be addressed, you know. Uh, in a way, open social sciences in the contemporary situation. Yeah. So I don't know if I have uh, made it clear, but this is a real uh, issue which is there. Uh, I, I just want to respond by giving you some information about some of Sanal's students and the work that they're doing. Uh, Sanal himself presented the work that they're doing with PRDS and with that early organization and gathering information, oral uh, narratives, uh, small pamphlets, booklets, <coughs> hymns, like looking at completely different kinds of materials that you do, the, do research from and materials which are close to these students. There is a emotional a connection between the materials and the students and that is very important. But what blew my mind is to meet a young <coughs> woman who was uh, in Kotem but doing research on the old slave market in Chagnasheri. Chagnasheri is a, a town about 15 kilometers away from Kotev, and it was, it actually was a, a slave market. And the, not so long ago, 50, 60 years ago, and she was going back to that area and bringing up the history of this slave market in that area. Now, I cannot think of more significant work that can be done uh, than the, and what this could lead to. So that's what, what I meant when I, we know early about the Dalit Students uh, Collective and the Dalit Women's Association and the discussions that took place, that we do have pre precursors and forerunners of very, very important work that has taken place. So I'm quarreling with you a little bit <laughs> uh, with your statement that it's not happening. Uh, I think that if we don't see what is happening, we will only see that it's not happening. It is happening, and what is happening is what 
uh, has to be focused on valued used. <coughs> Yes, please. Chandra Shekhar. First of all, I uh, say thanks to my professor Satyanarayan sir for organizing this conference because for me, uh, certain things are there which uh, I listen first time in my life in this conference. Uh, I really thanks to Professor Satnarayan Nehru. And second thing is, my words may uh, hurt some people who are here, but please don't take these words to hurt. But as uh, Madhu sir uh, gave a platform to speak, I'm just uh, trying to express uh, feelings from uh, Dalit students. Uh, there are many professors here who are guiding scholars, and uh, many scholars who are going to be professors and to uh, you know going to guide students like me. Uh, sir, I'm telling that you know we come from background where you know we don't have theory, philosophy, all these background, all this knowledge. After coming here, as my friend Mohan told that after coming here, we started to uh, listen some things. In my life, after coming to IFLU, I heard first time about Ambedkar in Professor Satyanarayan sir course. Uh, you know we don't have so much knowledge about all these things. When we suffer, uh, you know, you all know that upper caste professors are uh, suppressing us indirectly by playing language politics. Uh, they are not, you know, really helping us in many ways. But you at least, uh, professors who understood about our background, <coughs> who have come from a same experience, uh, please, uh, you know, remember your students, guide them, help them to understand. I am telling they don't they may not understand in a time or it may take time, but please be patient towards your students like me and uh, help them to understand things because after you, as you are uh, now in a position to take the visions of our people who, have, who are not with us, it's we who are going to take your visions forward after you. So please try in a such a way as Sharmila Rege has done. Uh, there are professors who are playing with us, like one professor was telling me indirectly to, and I didn't understand his class two, th two three times, and uh, to explain that he was using in a, in a different way by telling that Chan if I, Chandrasekhar, if I tell you that Chandrasekhar is hopeless because you are not understanding uh, what I am saying, you uh, know, two, three times, how do you feel? Uh, that's the way they are, uh, you know, playing with us. Please. You, at least you, who knew us, who knew our background, who knew our knowledge, train us to take things forward, which help us. Thank you so much. I think it is addressed to all uh, teachers <coughs> from this uh, social background, so I'll just quickly respond. See, there is uh, nothing to know, uh, become uh, uh, nervous. See, these words, you know, you don't need to actually bother about the theory, philosophy, and you know, politics or anything. Okay, it's uh, very much there in our life. Okay, only thing is you have to just realize. Don't the Dalit have philosophy? Don't the Adivasis have philosophy? Don't the other communities? Or in every community, in every individual's life, there is a philosophy, there is a politics, there is a theory of life. So it is there in our life. Only thing, as you said, you know, academicians, you know, play with this word. That's what I said. See, our, our, our Indian particular institution and universities are you now built. Uh, uh, within the uh, 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 Brahmanical Guru Shishya Parampara values. So, unless we break this uh, no, practices in the universities and uh, rebuild and reconstruct our universities uh, in a very alternative uh, no, way, we cannot do. See, uh, Sarmila could do some experiment uh, because she was heading that center and you know. Uh, and you know, she, she could do something independently. Was she in a particular department headed by a Brahmin or somebody? She wouldn't have done this. 
when i was in usmania i tried to change history curricula uh, curriculum but no upper caste teachers were no allowing me they were just teaching bullshit i mean sir just a book <laughs> sorry the <laughs> comment sir just completely political history it's a completely outdated no i you know pleaded them like anything like at least we let us introduce a social economic history so that no people understand uh, what happened uh, in the past so that is the you know irony of our you know, educational institution and this western that we generally you know carried away by the western theories and all that that's another again you know baggage on our thing academic care so we have to you know come out from this okay if you are doing your research you have to adapt your methodology in such a way that you know which you no know, uh, you know, which which gives you a free hand in your research okay i mean sir let us say like gopal guru uses this uh, humiliation humiliation means uh, whatever the you kind know, of issue you are doing that should be your methodology humiliation should be your methodology okay suppression should be your methodology resistance should be your methodology so research should be as research should be as you no know, Uh, resistance okay so you have to change your methodology yourself so that you will develop during your you no know, research when you are doing research don't bother about all these theories just you understand that that no these these theories exist in social science that's it that's it now and you just you no know, move away from that and do your own research that is how i am doing okay thank you okay ravi Yes, we have uh, just a few minutes left uh, of this uh, session. So, uh, okay. No, but anyway, Ravi will speak. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, actually, uh, this is something cultural studies department, which also shaped many of my political career. And though I'm not a department, you have a political career. No. Oh, so that uh, my political career. This is not that career, <laughs> but my political life in campus was shaped by the cultural studies department. And uh, no, don't true. say that. No, no, no anyway, <laughs> no, this is the beginning. I'll come to the end. So that this was the fact. Actually, <laughs> but always I had a, a feeling that cultural studies department always make research out of issues. The reason I'll tell you something. This has been for a long time. I've been feeling that yeah, they do a wonderful research. But in practical life, even none of your students, as far as I've seen, they're not. Uh, they do these topics as a research, as a topic of class, as a certificate course. One classic example I prove the data is: yesterday night there was a food dining, and if Ambedkar talked about the inner dining, yesterday's dining was a classic example, which I was very uncomfortable. yeah intellectuals all were discussing very busily but we were monitoring how the tables are faced so that in each table one dalit table and muslims and dalit table and upper caste table and women's table and one family table and i don't know how about the intellectual table so that this was there and this this even in the sittings in here you can see so there is no much interactions this interaction is always they uh, either if, uh, if upper caste has to speak to us they come and collect data it is not about uh, uh, that is there is one serious problem i find with the department so this is the only department which discuss caste and they only discuss caste uh, second thing is uh, this is one thing i want to put it forward because i think this is this will be my last conference also in this campus uh, the thing is uh, epw and research articles so that many of us feel that is a big thing to write in the, to write in that and i didn't know that when my article was published only because of satyanarayana sir and uh, that time people started talking about it so much so therefore i felt there are many people you it is the culture studies department if they can't show the way not the show i think there's a stigma with many students that social scientist article no no it's great to write i think culture studies should make an initiation to make sure that students write in editorials in hindu that apart from faculties writing there must be students also writing so these two things i put forward 
Thank you. Editorials in EPW? No, not editorial, even articles. There articles must be best research system. people are doing. Why can't faculties tell the students and make the, remove that stigma of writing and publishing it? Yeah, Reggie, okay, there are two, okay. Is it okay? So, I just want to uh, make a quick... Uh, quick, yeah. Uh, it's just that um, in, um, we appreciate the, uh, you know, the concern for understanding emancipation and all that. But what I'm saying is um, there is a kind of uh, uh, gap between the, uh, the, um, the academicians in that sense, the faculty or the people who are in uh, majorly in academia and the students who are researching on SOOP. Because when there are issues coming up in campus or in student lives, um, there is a serious um, uh, um, silence from the faculty members. So we don't um, find a kind of solidarity, um, which is quite disturbing. Um, sorry. Uh, what I'm saying is, um, <coughs> I don't know why I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, there is a serious kind of um, feeling that the students get that um, beyond in, beyond the theory or beyond the classroom, we don't get to uh, actually see, say, uh, faculty members talking, um, working towards emancipation or working towards political justice in in the institutions, which is uh, which is sad. I mean, uh, please. Uh, actually, I am very sorry for the late intervention. Uh, in this uh, August House, I feel there is some confusion uh, regarding the concept of Dalit. Uh, it is a uh, right that uh, so many peoples from Maharashtra and other parts uh, also nowadays uh, are uh, not ready to identify themselves with uh, as a Dalit and they like uh, concept like uh, Mula Nivasi, Bahuja or other things. It is because of I think uh, the stigma comes with this term but what is the original meaning of Dalit? Uh, in the conception of Dr. Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar himself was used this term so many times in his writings in Marathi since 1932. He continuously used this term, Dalit. What was the meaning with this term? That is very interesting. I want to aware this that Dr. Ambedkar never used this term for denoting only the untouchables or scheduled caste. He never used this term for untouchables. In Janata and Prabuddha Bharat, he used this term as a translation of the term proletariat class. And what he told, he told Dalit means untouchables, Shudras, tribes, nomads, <coughs> working class and women also. He very clearly, neatly explained all these things. He serialized, it is very interesting fact, he serialized the novel written by Maxim Gorky mother and also the writings of Karl Marx and Lenin on capital. And he <coughs> mentioned in his editorial note that's, that this is a world Dalit literature. That's why I want to aware that Dr. Ambedkar himself never used <coughs> this term for untouchables. Second one point is there. I come from Maharashtra. In Maharashtra, there is long tradition <coughs> of a anti caste struggle and Phule Ambedkarite feminist struggle also. In Maharashtra, since Dr. Ambedkar's period, a battalion of women are engaged 
in uh, anti caste and anti patriarchy movement on field and in theoretical intervention also they wrote lot many things in their vernacular language and local publications shantaram shantabai dani one very interesting thing that we nobody here knows the name of pratima pradeshi and saroj kamale very striking fact this two lady who are activist as well as theoretician and they wrote their writing in marathi only and they theorize conceptualize phule ambedkarite feminism and their booklets sold with lots of i, I think uh, there may be 30 or 40 edi edition of that booklet jyoti lanjewar and uh, urmila pawar sushila mul jadhav a galaxy of feminist scholars are there in maharashtra who continuously writing in marathi language <coughs> and uh, we are just ignore them because only of this uh, very big curtain of english language remove this curtain and go to the grassroots and find out there are so many number of sharmila regays are there in maharashtra thank you thank you okay we will uh, close this session and I'm very sorry we have to close this because uh, the workers are waiting just for us only. <laughs> so they are doing pressure, so I told them to wait so they have to close it. But otherwise we should have continued. So this is one of the processes. And uh, then stage man is coming. And many people are, can be oh. really surprised about how this stage is functioning at this time and all that. All these speakers, they tell me how is this, this is all run like that. So when uh, I told the one speaker, Milin, 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 I told him that you have to change the session. Then he said, I, I want to know the names of the people, I want their bird data and all that. Everything is there. They worked out under Parasarathi and the, uh, these members of the committee, Sudha, Priya Chandran, Safi, Gaurav, they worked out everything. They have all the bios, everything ready. You just have to go to sit there and they will give you. He said, so efficient and he was really surprised by this. So this is all made possible by, by this committee. And then uh, uh, the team, the, uh, the camera. Though uh, Gopal and everyone said, oh, Dalit camera is doing this. <laughs> I said, no, Dalit camera, we are not calling Dalit camera because of our local problem. So they are all doing it because of the level of the work. And we want to record this and see what, uh, what we can uh, do uh, out of this uh, kind of uh, material. So Ravi, Riya, Achut, Safiq, I think Abhi, Ajit, and many others, I think they have a lot of team, 24 into 7 uh, as it is happening. They are regarding uh, all this. In fact, uh, uh, Sanil, Professor Sanil was telling me that ICPR creates a lot of trouble for you. Because they, they don't accept your bills, they really create trouble. And they want uh, people actually eating the photographs and all. So Avi was taking a video recording. He said, I'll give them a video recording that it actually happened and people ate and they, they can count the numbers. <laughs> they, can, they can even see the menu and the food and so So that's uh, So I'm very, very thankful and I'm very, very uh, happy about this. And uh, then secondly, the ICPR for giving this generous uh, grant and also uh, the, the uh, Professor Gopal was on the committee was instrumental in getting this grant. So I want to thank uh, uh, ICPR and Gopal in particular for making this possible. And uh, uh, we don't have time to name, but all the uh, scholars, researchers, activists who agreed and came. Actually, they agreed quite some time back. It was some three, four months back they agreed. And uh, actually no one dropped except one person who dropped because of uh, health problem, Ramesh Kamble. But all others have stood by their word. In fact, it, this has not been my experience. For any of the conferences, they agree and after all they say this problem, that problem, all of them will drop out. None of them have dropped out. That is an amazing uh, experience for me. None of them dropped out and they came and they all made their representations. And the chairpersons, I only asked once all the chairpersons. Uh, they all agreed and came and they actually became part of this uh, and uh, so I was uh, really thankful to uh, all of them. Sometimes I, I might have been coercive as Eshita uh, was telling because I was actually talking to them that what should be presented and what to do this. 
and uh, their friends. So I asked them, you have to come. So I pressured them to come. I'm sorry to do that, but it really made a kind of wonderful uh, uh, kind of campus because you all came. And particularly, Ais Dasan's presentation is a stunning presentation for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> then uh, the participants, those who have uh, registered, non-registered, came through the last day through back door. So all of them, I thank them. <laughs> I really thank you. We didn't want to have a registration. We never had registration. In fact, one of the anxieties of not having the seminar on the campus, <coughs> my fear, is that participants won't come. So in fact, by morning, one of the, some of the speakers were asking, today will the students come? So what will be the hall like? So this was this was also my anxiety. So so that was from that stage to now. So we have to turn down some people saying that the hall is full and the registration is over. And then the, and our uh, uh, committee, which is looking out registration, has put this condition. You send the CV and why you are interested, though I am not very uh, happy about it. They said, no, we have to insist. So And they did it in a professional manner. And uh, so some people who are left out would have been unhappy. I am sorry we could not account it. It's really a problem of the hall and space, nothing else. It's not that we don't want to uh, screen out anybody. But despite that, so uh, thank you all of you for putting up with all these uh, difficulties. And also all the colleagues from our university, those who chided and also those who came. And in fact, I just sent one mail and many of them came and participated and helped in various ways. And also from other universities, local universities, uh, whether it is Reka or uh, from HCU, Ratish and all these people. I'm not naming them because they're all friends and also we don't have uh, time. And uh, also the uh, here, uh, Dr. Babu, who is not there here, is a scientist and who really helped us to get this place and also to uh, arrange accommodation. And they really helped us in the last minute because uh, um, our dad speaks long, long ago. I booked uh, these three days. Uh, uh, the hall was booked, but the EFLU administration who doesn't have a sense of uh, any time or any planning. So they generally say, we are conducting entrance uh, on these dates, so you don't have it. So after the poster is out, they said, uh, three days, you, you cannot have it here, you have it somewhere else. So at that time, I approached Babu, Babu said, Not, nothing to worry, we will do it and we will give you this, and he did this. So I thank uh, Babu and also the local uh, staff who are waiting outside and uh, the director. And also the, the, the department uh, team, uh, so I wanted to name our colleagues and particularly Krishna and Prasanna and Jyoti who have also been working 24 into 7 those the last <laughs> And uh, it was possible because of them to get the check and all that. Any small thing to happen administration, you have to back up, you have a student back up, you have an administrative back up and so on. So the, they are really pursued and got the money and distributed on time and so on. And uh, all the participants are they are very happy. that. Uh, and the second day itself, you are able to give it and all that. But behind that, our staff was there. They are the really following it up and, uh, and following it up. So I thank them. They are not, they are not here. And uh, finally, and if I have forgot anybody's name, it's, the, it's not by any deliberate this thing, by mistake. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you are, I have not mentioned it. So, no, what I am saying is that there is a team. So I have not mentioned the team. So the team includes uh, very uh, many, many uh, people. But in the team, only I am mentioning only one uh, name, that is uh, Sujit's name, particularly because uh, uh, Sujit is leaving and going to JNU. It is going to be such a loss to the department. And especially after this conference, we can really see this. But on behalf of the department and all of you, I want to wish all the best for his uh, career and for his uh, work. So, I'm saying, do some questions to keep students here. <laughs> <laughs> we are trying, and we should also try now. So, I thank all of you. If I have forgotten anybody, uh, I'm very sorry, but I thank all of you for all this. Thank you very much. And one, one word, one word. So, obviously, the all the student uh, responses and other responses, they're actually outlining several agendas for both the department and the faculty and so on. So those need to be taken up uh, really seriously, we will think about it and those are really genuine concerns and we will take it up seriously, we will think about it and thank you very much. And clap for Satya. <laughs>